So our next performer has got a little bit of Fisher poetry in his blood. He also is a fisherman, been setting at her for 16 years. Max Broderick, come on up. How's everybody doing tonight? Thank you. <clears throat> so I, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? yeah? All right, cool. So I, uh, I just walked out of the voodoo a few minutes ago, a uh, few amazing sets there, and I heard somebody ask, so, uh, somebody standing next to me, what's going on? Is there a party or something? Somebody was like, no, it's the Fisher Poets. They're like, the Fisher Poets, what's, what's that? He's like, you haven't heard of the Fisher Poets? Like, everybody's heard of the Fisher Poets. Come on. So, uh, as the uh, MC said, I've been uh, set netting up in Bristol Bay, Nishigak, for years uh, with my family. And uh, it's, been, it's been really good to, to me and to my family, and it's uh, considered in my blood now. So, uh, I've got a couple poems for you here, one from a couple years ago, and then a couple of new stories. New, new ones, so a little bit of prose, too. I'll just jump right in it. Um, the first one's titled Limits, and it's, uh, it's about how occasionally you get put on limits by the cannery because you're bringing in too many fish uh, bay-wide, and you know, they need to control the amount of fish that you bring in, so they put you on limits per permit. And sometimes it's, it's a blessing. Other times it kind of ruins your season because you can't catch as many fish as you might otherwise be able to. <clears throat> sometimes you can't catch a couple of fish some sometimes you catch too much you either can't pay the bills or the cannery is plugged you might get paid a buck and a half or maybe 50 cents to pull gear and pick fish and pay your mortgage or rent you might have a menu monumental haul and then be told the cannery is full and in the pissing rain with fish your nets you'll have to pull and grumble on your way to the tender that you could have caught much more if the cannery could keep up with all the fish you brought ashore. On your way to the tender, though, still grumbling a bit about all those fish that were running and now are being missed, comes yet another announcement on your VHF radio. The cannery's no longer plugged. Back to your sights you go. But due to the volume of harvest the fishermen are bringing in, the canneries now put you on limits per permit, my friend. You grumble further to your mates about the inconvenience of having to pull your gear when fishing was such a buzz. And tired and sick of, of not knowing what price you're fishing for and get a, getting pounded by a southeasterly on the shore. But as soon as you catch your limit, you know that you can go in. So you stop bitching about the unfortunate and you set your nets again. Pulling and picking your nets clean and plowing to the tender was a pain in the ass. And by the time you get them back in the water, the smoking hot fishing has passed. There's still a relatively steady trickle of fish until just high slack. Then boom, the fish train's there, and you're trying to get your nets back from out of the churning water where if you catch too many, you charitably donate fish to the company that's paying you pennies per pound for wild Alaskan sockeye sustainably harvested from Bristol Bay by fishers like me and you who are grinding for our pay. We pull the nets while they light up as we think we are past our allotted limit. Knowing there's only a few pushes like this per year, we grumble, God damn it. To know that we are letting by a large portion of the salmon peak and have nowhere to sell our fish during the salmon run streak. Our method of not going over our limit, <clears throat> our method of prevention, is not born of efficiency, is not one of pure invention. We horse the net in as quick as we can, all in an unorganized pile, and going back through to get the fish out takes a damn good while. So you sit on the pick, sifting through tangles of fish with a bit of a hole in your chest, because under your keel are swarms of fish and you're sit sitting on top of your nets. But woe is us as we head once again toward the tender while cleaning our gear. With a boatload of fish, shackles, line, and anchors, halfway to the tender we hear. A crackle on the radio. Could it be Channel 80? The cannery? Our masters? 
Our limits increased once again, 500 pounds per permit. Hooray, those bastards. A whimper of exasperation or desperation creeps out of one of us. So we turn around, plow to that muddy spot where we'll sift this evening's flood. And though we really appreciate the attempt by our buyer to allow us to catch what, what we can within their capacity, we're mired. We pulled our nets twice already during a really strong push and now need to set them again on the muddy banks of the Nush to reach our wavering and apparently unattainable limit of fish when it's thick, thick they're plugged, and we're in it. Thank you. Um, so set netters spent a lot of time in shallow water and in the mud maneuvering their nets and dragging their nets and pulling their nets around and walking up to the inside to kick the anchor in and <clears throat> this is a, uh, a poem about, uh, a, it's just called the mud flop. Um, occasionally you slip and you fall or your buddy slips and falls and this is just a funny story about a, a spill I took a few seasons ago. Taking the slog through the mud one night to make sure our inside anchor was going to hold tight, I made my way from skiff through mud, each step a slop, when I made a tremendous uproarious flop. See, there's different tiers of mud in the bay, and as set netters of the know might say, some mud is thin and caked, not too much moisture within. Others are tacky, thick, sticky, slimy, and or thin. Some Bristol Bay mud is deep and smells sour. Other muds are shallow, slippery, and scoured. A few of the muds have a pebble or two, and the mud flat has a green algae goose. Set netters spend a fair amount of time in this medium and pride ourselves sometimes for being premium mud walkers, treasures, connoisseurs, and specialists. Some of us might consider ourselves mud impressionists. However, I think those of us who have trod over the mud have seen a slip or a catch or a fall from one of our buds, and it was in the similar fashion in which I made my slip, which my hand Dan heard 100 yards upwind, manning our skiff. See, I'd left Dan at the skiff as I trod up towards the anchor, each step on the way pushing air up through my waders of my own kind of stank, or maybe the scent coming from inside made my waders could be found in most of the fishermen laborers. I was headed to make our final procedural move so we could pitch off our fish, head back to the cabin and snooze. Making the last motion of our shift, the old anchor kick in to secure the net for the flood so that we could head in. That way the net would be secure for an hour or two till we got to the cabins and the other crew could come out to sift the raging flood and hopefully find the net where they should. A good southeaster blew my stench away from Dan with our skiff and our fish from the bay. Nonetheless, as I trod towards our inside of our net, on the way I made a move I regret. regret. Perhaps I looked up at the goals in the sky or was drifting off to sleep in my mind. Either way, I hit a patch of severe wet thin mud on dry, and I swooped through the air, legs up towards the sky, flailing my legs like the cartoon character Wile E. Coyote and I did a suspended two-second floaty. Dan heard the clack of my back hitting the ground. It must have been an impressive sound to be heard from such a distance with the wind blowing with its pesky persistence. He turned and looked up to find me laid flat out, and a little worried he hollered and shouted, Are you okay? I just raised my hand in the air. Yeah. It took me a moment to get up off the mud dust off my shoulders and continue the trudge to the inside anchor waiting to be kicked for the final movement of our shift. I got back to Dan at the boat with a smirk from ear to ear laughing at me and how could he possibly hear me who'd fallen ass flat on his back a hundred yards away and we still talk about that mud flop today. Uh, this is kind of just a story um, about sport fishing. Um, as a commercial fisherman, I uh, <clears throat> didn't really understand sport fishing for the longest time. 
didn't make any sense to me, and um, so I wrote a little, little bit about my feelings and uh, how I've evolved towards feeling towards sport fishing because now I love it. I used to think that sport fishermen were cute. Silly sport guys with their little tackle vests on and their colorful tackle and their rods excited about going fishing. Using sporty jargon like, jargon like, how's the color today? Or, landed a chrome hand yesterday? You should probably use a green and blue K-13 quick fish with a little tuna belly. Or, what color B did you get her on? Mottled pink or crimson chartreuse? Always talking about river levels, how she's going to blow out, but should drop into shape next week. How funny to fish for sport, to spend hours, days, weeks, months even, chasing an elusive fish, which I've killed thousands of in a day. And the gear needed, different types of terminal tackle, sizes and profiles of hooks, leader tests and lengths, Yarnies, beads, jigs, flashers, eggs, bobbers, and associated bob stoppers, level wind reels, trolling reels, spinning reels. Cute. I'll slap my gill net out and catch dinner for a few hundred families in a couple minutes. I tried sport fishing a few times as a kid. The most memorable experience when I was about seven years old and while fishing for trout, my brother hooked a native coho from Ecola Creek that was the size of me at the time. He somehow teased it to shore where I grabbed it and gave it a big bear hug, trying to wrestle it to the top of the bank. It made a tremendous movement and slipped from my hug, snapped the line, wriggled to the water, and swam off. Fun. It wasn't until years later that I found myself exploring sport fishing with my best bud, trolling on the Columbia River. I was fresh from Alaska and didn't have any particular interest in spending a day trying to catch another salmon, but I got the invite and had little else to do that day. I also didn't have many expectations. I still thought it was a little silly and almost felt I was betraying some deep down belief I had buried within myself about fishing for sport as a commercial guy. We placed our lines in the water, flashers, weights, cut plug herring, and dropped to the bottom. An hour later, I found my hands shaking so hard from excitement and exhilaration and loss that I wasn't able to rebate my hooks. My buddy laughed his ass off it, at me and said that seeing a Bristol Bay gill netter trembling like a baby over one lost Chinook was about the funniest thing he'd ever seen in his life. I had hooked a fish, fought it, and lost. It was amazing. I was hooked. Now I find myself obsessed with those beads, every little variation which might help me hook a steelhead on the river, the perfect brine for herring or cure for salmon or steelhead eggs. I monitor river levels and anticipate tide changes. I spend weekends, mornings, holidays, lunches on the river chasing a tug on my rod. How did I become a cute little sport guy? I went fishing. try another new one out. It's got a, just a little bit of time here. It's relatively short. Um, haven't worked the kinks out of it yet. Wrote it this morning. <clears throat> it's called uh, the first opener in bad weather and somehow inevitably every year uh, the first opener of the season tends to be in just some terrible weather and we're all rusty and we all try to go out there and fish and we just get beat up. Uh, here it goes. Fish and game determines when the right time to fish is based on salmon escapement and tends to give us our first fishing period during a time most folks would be in their basements. We'd get the news of an opener tomorrow at 1 o'clock in the morn. Coupled with a stiff 40 knots southeast forecast gave us a feeling of forlorn. We're a little rusty because we haven't done this routine in 330 days. And of course, like clockwork, the southeasterly is on its way. 
We can't miss an opener, though. A single one might make your year. And that's why even though there's a gale, we ready and pull on our gear. A minus tied to a 22-footer is what we're going to sift. So we navigate the channels across the bay in our aluminum skiffs. We know very well how this is likely to unfold, with us scrambling to get her set, hoping that our anchors will hold. And somehow, despite the challenges we face, we manage to get her set just so, right in place. Now we've got to figure out what in the hell we're going to do. And with the incoming tide, the bar is no longer exposed, and the waves are beginning to climb higher and steeper as the tide rushes in and fills the belly of our net, and the situation sinks in. It's too rough to roll and too shallow to get into tow, and our anchors are holding despite the heavy toll of the rushing tides and howling winds, so we idle around, scratching our chins. Although the fish are running strong, it's not safe to stick it out, so we have to get our gear out of the water, but how? The only real option is to throw an anchor line and have the wind swing us around so that a hand can jump off in the shallows where he can touch ground. We maneuver our 24-foot aluminum can just so we let off a man who trips the inside anchor line, and as the net begins to flow with the tide, we pick up our man and we start to go, pounding through the washers looking for our inside trip with <clears throat> so we can pick up our net and get out of this nasty shit. We manage to bring the net and a couple of green ones on board before we begin bailing and headed home once more. A once a year experience for Nishigek set netters is the season's first period. And if it's nasty, we give it an attempt, head back to the cabins, tired and delirious. If next season's first period is during a big storm, well, grab our gear, head for our sights, and try to fish it like normal. Thank you.